good. Well, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say, I'm gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna pray now, we're gonna do that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray, let's pray. So Father, we thank you for uh, this day, thank you for the opportunity that uh, we have to be together with you, and thank you for all you do, continue to, to sustain us and provide for us and help us to get through each and every day and opportunities to see your hand in sad moments and trying moments and joyful and blissful moments. We think about all the joys we have in life that you give us, moments of opportunities to be reminded that this uh, life can have some moments of joy and, and pleasantries and happiness and has its share of trials and tribulations as well. And you tell us not to be shocked by that or surprised by that. We're going to have that. So we ask you continue to help us to bring perspective of those dynamics of our gearism, goodnesses that you bring upon us, our e-balls, uh, those uh, aligning to that uh, time when you told Moses to have the people hear blessings and curses from these two mounts, reminding us that life's all about having both of these things that we incur. We're not exempt ever from one or the other. We, we have both in our life. We have to see and perceive your hand in it all, your purpose in it all, and your ordained will in it all for the benefit of us as your children. So thank you now as we continue to see um, some scriptures that you continue to talk about that we're aligning with, separate from, and time frame, but similar unto a prophetic uh, awareness of what's out ahead and preparing us to know what to, uh, to perceive and understand and be prepared more so in our heart, mind, soul, and spirit. So help us be um, the children in your eyes, to be pleasing to you, continue to seek you and see your hand, your will, and uh, the scripture and how it affects our lives. We ask all this uh, to you as our counselor, our pastor, our shepherd, our bridegroom, uh, our, our, <laughs> our great counselor. And, and Lord, we ask that uh, the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in, in your sight. And we thank you so much for all you have done, are doing, and yet to do. In Jesus, Yeshua's name, we pray these things. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk about the unjust steward today. But to, to remind you where we left off with the, uh, the prodigal son, it was actually a, a contrast between the two. Uh, remnant folks of the people of covenant who become uh, a mikros, not technically in testament, but they do get a belief in Christ, and they they, they get this uh, avenue uh, when they are seen at Petra from Christ, and that side of that story is contrasted against those soon medicos people uh, who endured such tremendously crazy trials and 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 tough times the last half tribulation, and then of course get acclimated to being of the precious promise, pre precious promise. But during that Jacob's ministry, they see like, well, what is this, you know, like, and, and it's just a shock to see that you've got to be kidding me, uh, you know, that this is going on on earth, giving these people more latitude, more compassion, more love, it, it, the Jewish people, that is, who were of covenant and 144,000 that survived, that 5 million onslaught who, who, who were murdered roughly, it's just, it's by, by the beast, it, it's just mind boggling. And so that's the contrast of the story behind it all. He's just, that's why the... The, the faithful father telling that son, you know, whatever I have has always been yours as part of that promise to, um, to the bride. He's able to say, yeah, you've been through some, some stuff, but it isn't like they're exempt from that either. But more importantly, they were given a promise prior to you ever coming into existence. And that's the covenant promise he gave to Abram and he gave to his people. Again, they were the ones who were the dust of the earth, um, sand of the sea, stars of the heaven. They were given that promise through Abram and we were grafted into that, right? So. Anyway, with that being said, we, we talked about some other things regarding how the Lord continues to show from chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, the avenues of not just parables and stories, but behavioral traits and, and preparations of introspection to ourselves and how we should look at ourselves and how we should be um, preparing ourselves for what is out ahead. One of the questions I was asked in regards to uh, this study um, that we were, we're going to have today, but weeks ago when we were under the um, not doing well category <laughs> and we were not able to come here, um, we had the avenue of saying, okay, well, what do we do with the issue of like, hey, you have this four unique parable chart, but this story of the unjust steward is not a parable. And it's not even mentioned as that compared homeo u word that I mentioned on the chart, so why did I include it? And that's because of the fact that uh, as we're about to see, the events in the unjust steward story speak to what happens now and what happens in messianic reign. And he makes that very clear. And we're, we're going to see that. And so that's the reason why I, I included it. And so because the parables with the homeo who compared unto are doing just that. They're speaking of events now compared to what's out ahead regarding um, uh, the, the, the debtor and the king 
uh, the ten virgins, and of course the wheat and the tares. The, and now we have this one. So these things speak to what is now happening and what is out ahead. This doesn't speak that same beginning language, but I included it because of its uniqueness, how it doesn't include that language of saying it's a parable or saying it's compared unto, but in essence is the only one that actually talks about events in clear nature of what has been happened, what, what has happened, excuse me, what has happened and been recorded, and now what's happening because of that. You're like, wait, what? In other words, um, for those of us who are um, understanding that God does not judge us yet. We know that, right? So all judgment is given order to the Son. And that happens to us at the Bema Seat. So as soon as you see a scripture talking about adjudication or a judgment or rewarding or stripping of responsibilities, that, that's Bema Seat stuff. That doesn't happen right now. You don't get judged now. So people say, oh my goodness, that hurricane happened to those people. They got judged by God. No, they didn't. God does not judge right now. The all judgment is given order to the Son. And that's prolonged until the beam is seat. So when you, you think that stuff or say that stuff or hear that stuff, that's just human nature reacting to the fact that that's how we discern it and filter it. But just remember, those are consequences of sin and of man's hand continuously against God. And God going, okay, well, this is going to continue to pick up steam and roll downhill. And you're not going to like the pretty picture of the avalanche, how it destroys the village. But don't come yelling at me saying, I judged you. No, I told you that the calamity of sin will pick up steam and get worse and worse and worse. Even on, among Christendom, there'll be a great apostasy. So why are you shocked that in a worldly sense there's cataclysmic things that happen? What I'm shocked by is preachers and teachers and people in Christendom who call it judgments from God. That is not true. It's not. All judgments reserved to the Son, and the Son reserves that judgment for the, for the beam of seat and then followed later by the great white throne. And uh, it's all about him. And he's not judged right now, so how is he judging that, by the way? He's in a priestal capacity to forgive and mediate for our sins. So not only are you ignorant, no offense, when you say that, and, and you're humanist, by the way, we've all been there, right? I'm not trying to make a point, you think we've all been there. <laughs> I'm just saying that when we do that, we, we, we are forgetting the role and responsibility of our Savior, who he is, and therefore, what say you of your role and responsibility? And so it's kind of get that check. We've got to check ourselves, always uh, vet ourselves against the truth of who our Lord is. And therefore, when we get that perspective of remembering how trace high priest, okay. So what does that mean about us? So one, we shouldn't be judging because he's not. But more importantly, we should be focused on taking advantage. Like Paul says, pray without ceasing. Constantly be taking advantage of this opportunity he's given us to constantly get ourselves, you know, without these blemishes and spots and sins on us. You know, we want, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. Like First John 1, 9 is a beautiful verse, you know. Um, so anyway, so with that being said, the, the unjust steward story uh, is, is picked up on. There's a couple of nuances that if you just read the story, and I'll be honest to tell you this, that I have heard this story by myself taught different ways in the past. I'm indicting myself right now. Okay, I'm telling you right now. I have taught it different ways all day from Tuesday. And the reality is, is that it's because it is not an easy thing to understand. It, it's just not. And when you just read it, so if you just pulled open the scripture, I don't care what translation you have, even if it's a dialogue, and you put, pulled it open and start reading without any context of, of suffixes, of the plurals, of meanings of words that are being used, nomenclature that's being talked about, cultural idioms that are being in, in, implied, references of things that are being Old Testament happened before when they first were mentioned, how they apply to the actual text. If you ignore all of that and just go, I'm going to read it like I'm reading a magazine and I'm going to read it here like I'm reading a newspaper article, there's no way you're going to come away with the understanding. So if folks that don't understand that, then I can't even express to you anything else. Just turn this off and just delete the rest of this message. But if you understand what I just said, then, then please understand that therefore we all know that, that a text out of context is a pretext. And a pretext has no text at all. There's no text. You can't just begin and assume with your Western mindset what you think and what you want it to be. So there's a couple of things that we have to get these nomad, these different, different like, uh, there's, an old, there's, a, there's an old phrasing like, you know who the actors are. You know, who's who, right? So let's talk about who's who before we just get involved in this, right? So first of all, the unjust steward, who is he, she, this person, right? I'm not going to get gender specific. You'll hear me say he. I don't mean to say that as if it's a, if it, it's a male gender. 
It could be either gender. It's irrelevant. I just say that as a you know reference generalization. I say you guys, stuff like that. You know, it could be either one. So unjust steward is the microsperma who hid that silver in the napkin back in Luke 19, 20, and 24. And that particular story, I'm not going to go there and read it all, but you can remember the man knew, the Mikros person knew he was a harsh man. And secondly, the Lord calls him Paneros. Like, what? That, that's not even fun. I mean, then he says, everything that you have is going to be taken from you. Understand that phrasing is uniquely interesting because it means it's almost, and, and the imagery that you see in Luke 19, later on, is the same imagery in Luke 16 when he says, I want to take from you your stewardship. And I want you to understand what this means. And I've seen it in, in, in documentaries. I've seen it in movies. I've read it in books. And, I, and I've had it happen to myself. It's not fun. It's when, it's when you imagine, <laughs> it's when the authorities of the possessions that you own <laughs> come into your domain and say, okay, th this now is going with us. They're taking from you what was given to you on the basis of the relationship that is no longer the same. That is a crazy idea that we all, I mean, an idea, it's not, it's not crazy, it's a crazy reality to deal with because it is demoralizing, it is emotional, it is a mental strain. And if you haven't experienced that, because I have, it's not cool. It's not cool at all. Don't get, don't, you don't have to ask me what I mean by that. Let's just say I've been in this situation where I've had people come in and then just take stuff. Take from me. It's like, they, like, it's like someone says, oh, you're now the second in charge of the armies, and the, and the, and, and the actual commander in chief comes in, strips the stars off my, off my jacket, takes the hat off, takes my whole uniform off. All I got on is my skivvies and my socks, and the whole uniform, everything that deals with my authority and my uh, position is stripped out of my household. That's the image that's going on here. It's not fun. It is tremendously heart-wrenching. It's mentally, emotionally, spiritually, like a big punch in the gut. It is like, are you kidding me? So it's bad enough that you, Lord God, are saying this to me. But the fact that you're doing this, oh my God, this is just a gut punch. That How do you recover from that? And that's the reason why you have to appreciate how much difficulty it has to be for any human being, male or female, I don't care, I'm a strong woman, I'm a strong man. It doesn't matter. As a human, it's very difficult to overcome that and then have the end result be that your master said, you know, I applaud you for how you overcame in that situation. Yeah, no kidding. That's why later on he's going to be applauded because of how he responds to a very difficult, difficult situation that you don't recover from. All you can do is respond correctly. It's the only choice he has. There's no restoration. There's no recovery. There's just, what are you going to do now? <laughs> well, I mean, you just gut punched me. You saying what you said was demoralizing. Doing what you did was a gut punch. What do I do now? And he responds with just this great, we're going to get into that, and how the Lord says, I applaud you. He praised him because he knew that all he could do was do that. That's the only option he had that was a good option was to respond rightly, and he did with no restoration in view, with no benefit and blessing that was permanent in view, just some, he got a short little blessing in, in exchange, but it wasn't some long last, it's pretty awesome stuff, but yeah, if you have questions, sorry. I was just saying that you could compare it to being fired, not from yeah. a job that you just took minimum wage, but one that you prepared for a long time. Uh -huh. I know what that's like, and it mm -hmm. was a gut punch, and that's the only day I've ever hyperventilated. I was so shocked, I, I, I didn't breathe in my autonomy. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I mean, yeah. I See what and what you see. People don't we, so realize that in the story. So there's two dynamics there, right? So the people who come to your office or, or your whatever, so your home, and, and they start having that. They come. They're obviously when if they're coming to you, they have they have authority over you, right? So there's that sense of how they have authority over you, and then the fact that they're there in front of you in group. There's like the main person. There's usually other entourage with them, God and his angelic host, and you're like, oh my gosh, that that scene already makes you go. You just start to, start to hyperventilate or swoon or get, get panicked. Me, my heart starts to go, it starts to beat really fast in that kind of situation. Like, what's going on right now? Why is this happening? My heart starts to go, but I just can't control it. It just starts to, well, yeah, but then, then, then there's the action they do. There's two different things. Door, uh, you know, that, that bit. Well, no, it's the ungodly. It's, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm not even worried about that. So that's the whole, so here, so going back to the scripture, so in verse one, so in verse one, he's going to talk about how the, the, he said, this is Jesus, Yeshua. He said, also, 
to the disciples. Now also what? What we just talked about in Luke 15 on top of Luke 14 is this is all tied together. So you can't sit here and tell me, well, Luke 16 is by itself separated based on what? Because it's based on, if you read the scripture from Luke 13 and 14, it's talking about a marriage feast, and we talked about that already. We're not going to belabor that anymore and continue to go back and go again and again. We, we, we've mentioned that. But now we have a segue between chapter 14 and 15 about discipleship. He goes into the ideas about that with the tower, with the king, with the salt. Then he goes into the analogies of the sheep and the drachma. But they told the story of the prodigal son, the faithful father. And then he says in chapter 16, and he said also, also, to those disciples, to those disciples, to those, to those, not, not the 12, to all those hearing him. Remember, back in Luke 14, it was those crowds, remember? So there's people that from the Luke 14 ending passage into Luke 15's other avenues of talking about the sheep, the drachma, and the two sons and the faithful father. There's more people actually following him. So he's saying, let me, let me explain to you some things. So when you might, you might think, why is he telling a micro story about a guy who's unjust to the 12 apostles who, that's not them. That's right, because there's more than just them in view. He didn't say oi, he said tos. So those disciples, those who have been, again, following him, and, and again, that means under his tutelage, students ad adhering to what he's teaching, which they are doing, which he said that back in Luke 14, we, we covered that, remember? So here they are, and so, and remember that I want you to also think about when he says steward, because in Galatians 4.2, the word guardians, it, it means that they're managers, and they're managers of the sporos of the word of God. Whereas a steward is a household manager of the sperma secrets of the kingdom of the heavens and the sporos word of God. So a guardian and a steward are both managers. So think of it in a retail way. Who's higher in rank, store manager or district manager? area manager, the executive man, right? The word manager, okay, this means you're overseeing responsible for things. It doesn't mean you're the same. So a steward has the same role at a higher magnitude because they have more accountability to what they've been given. That's why they're an okonomon, right? Uh, so, he, I, I, so you go into this okonomon, steward, household manager. Also, I want to get into now the the, the, fa the fact that people sometimes say, oh, we're sons of God. Later on, you're going to hear, hear about this passage where, in the, in the scripture where he says, and the sons of the age this. And people, you've got to remember Romans 8, 23. So I want you to just, this is a side note. I won't go too many. I'm going to, right, right after we read this, I'm going to go right back to Luke 16. But in Romans 8, 23, I want to remind you, for those who say, prove it. Oh, okay, yes, no problem. In Romans 8, 23, and not only, most is about verse 22 for context, for we know that the whole creation, the whole catesis, the whole catesis, groans together and travails in pain together till the present time. Now he's talking about the new creation people. So he said, not only it, but ourselves also possessing the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves because we're already sons. No. We're awaiting sonship. So why is it that people in Christendom keep telling you and me that we're already sons of God? No, 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 no. We're children of God who await the adoption. Is that not what Romans 8.23 says? You look at the word for adoption. It's a combination of the word to adopt as sons. We are the beginning of the word. So again, that is a key understanding because if you read Luke 16, and you think that all people in Christendom are sons of God who believe in Jesus. But well, you're going to be way off, my friend. You're going to be way off. Way off. So you could be a son when you either enter or inherit the messianic reign. So you're going to enter the heavens. You're going to enter or inherit the earth. I don't know. But I can tell you one thing. If I consider it a son, if you actually go to Hades or Gehenna, that's not fun. That's not fun at all. When you're disinherited, you became a child who is now um, no longer a child within the promise of living out the blessings that were intended for you. Because of your lack of reconciliation, your lack of sanctification unto God. Look yourself in the mirror. 
but I digress. But now going back to Luke 16, a couple things I want you to remember, right? So in Luke 16, verse 1, and he, Jesus, Yeshua, said, that's the context, also, also in combination with the two 13 and 14 chapters about the marriage feast, about the discipleship at the end of chapter 14, about the stories about what discipleship means, about the ending of the last story about the prodigal son, faithful father. And he said also, things that we're dealing with, the future prophetic messianic reign in the heavens and on the earth, things that would incur. I didn't write the book, but that's exactly what he's talking about. And he said also. So that's what's in context. I don't care what you say. Because that's the facts. He says, oh, I don't want to believe that. That's fine. Then be wrong. But the fact of the matter is, you can interpret the scripture differently, but don't lie to yourself and tell yourself that he is also teaching them and then changing the whole venue point, what he's been doing for the last three chapters. He's not teaching prophetic anymore. He's not teaching about future events that affect heaven and earth and the messianic reign. Why wouldn't he be? When he just said, and he said also to the disciples, he's continuing, there was a certain rich man, it's a certain rich man, who had a steward. And this word steward again, okonoma, a household manager. And he was accused. That means he was diablethi. That means he was uh, casting, they were casting disparaging and negative comments about him. In what way? That he was wasting. And the word wasting is dia corpizon. Dia means through, and corpiza mean, corpiza means to squander. So he was thoroughly squandering the possessions given to him. Understand that. Thoroughly. He wasn't just like, you know, haphazardly, you know, every now and then. He was thoroughly, in the eyes of God, squandering the precious secrets of the mysteries that God gave to him. Now remember, God's a, God's a harsh man. It says in the scriptures, Luke 19, Matthew 24, he, he takes up what he doesn't lay down. He expects interest on what he gives us. So people say, oh, God's clemency and compassion and loving, and he is. But when it comes to what he gives you as an accountability and what he gives you as a responsibility, there's a lot more latitude that you have when you don't have accountability, but when you do have accountability at a higher level of being gifted blessings and benefits from God that are unique to only a few, th that ratchets up the expectation he has of you as your father. Just, just, just a heads up, okay? So the reality is that this is what's being talked about, that the accusation is not just coming against any common Joe in Christ. It's against the household manager, which is who? Anybody who's been given the sperma, me grossing up, who has received it, has been given the opportunity to live as, to grow onto a household manager. Because they've been given the, stu they've been given the sperma, which is the seed within a seed, of the secrets of the kingdom of the God, so they've been given the secrets of the kingdom of the God as a privilege, and they're supposed to grow thereby into different levels of understanding. And when they don't do that, so they're supposed to, they, they were, they're a new household manager, as a Mikros, if you will, but they're supposed to grow onto what that position was intended for them to be. And here's this guy squandering what he's been given. What are you doing? Right? I say guy, remember, I don't mean that gender specifically. So he's squandering thoroughly. He's being accused of squandering. Accused. So it didn't say as a fact, he was accused. Yes? Todd asked, why would I have circled was accused falsely? <laughs> well, that might have been an old teaching, don't know. But I can tell you that the accusation is important to note because it wasn't that the certain rich man said he was wasting. He said that he had a certain steward, he was a certain rich man who had a steward who was accused of squandering thoroughly the possessions. So I don't know exactly why, other than probably an old teaching. I don't know, we haven't taught on this specifically for a very long time. I have not taught on this passage, I don't think in, I would say seven, 10 years. It's gotta be, I haven't even touched on it in that long. I mean, I may have referenced it, but I haven't gone to this passage in a very long time. So that could be some of that, I, I don't know. Um, good question. But I can tell you this, it, it goes into verse two, and it says, and he called him, and that word called is phonesas, 
It doesn't mean to call it in kaleitoi or kaleo. It means phonesis. That means actually the voice. He said, K -k -k like he calls out like, come here, come here. What, what is this I hear about you? So he's basically saying, okay, there's an accusation I heard. Tell me about it. Render an account. So he's giving him the chance to come clean or to re-narrate what the truth is. So if he is falsely accused, then it'll come out right here, right? That's not what happens, unfortunately. Yes? And um, <coughs> Vicki mentions, I have a note that this is a mammon problem, probably more than that. Laney said, how was he squandering, um, neglecting study time, or forgetting to share this info? Okay of sperma. Okay, so let's let's answer that question. So he says, what is like what is like for verse two he said he calls him, that means he's as a voice to speak to him, like come come here. What does this I hear about you? And what did he hear about him? That he was accused that he was being that he was being having disparaging remarks that are negative comments about how he was thoroughly, thoroughly squandering his possessions. What are his possessions? It's that hoopo uh, word. It means that the possessions are the things under his care. The things that were given unto him. For example, in the same book of Luke, as we started, if you go back to Luke and you go to chapter 12 again to remind you of who the wise and faithful steward is, he, he, mentions, he mentions how he says that this person in verse 42, the faithful steward and wise, whom they will appoint the Lord over all his domestics, which is basically that what he needs care and attention to, of himself, and to give and seize in the measure of food. But then later on, he mentions the other wording in verse 44, after he says that verse 43, the happy that servant whom his master at his arrival shall find thus employed, Verse 44, I tell you truly, this is Luke 12, 44. I tell you truly that he will appoint him over all his, there's your, his property. All the things that are belonging, that are under his care. His huponas. So he, he has this under his care possession. So in other words, whatever the master has under his care, that's involving everything. That's sperm, sporos. That's everything. So the possession that he's squandering we don't know the exact nature of the measure of grace and faith that was given to him. But it's not all the possessions of the, of the master or the rich man. It just says his possessions that he was given to him. So maybe the certain rich man gave him possessions that were equal to who knows, right? I don't know. So the reality is whatever possessions he had, the point is not how much he had. The point is he was given possessions from the certain rich man who is the type of God the Son, who gave him a great wealth of secrets of the mysteries of the kingdom of God kingdom of the heavens. And he did nothing with it. He utterly, thoroughly squandered it. Which means he didn't study it out for himself to get enlightened with who God is in his word. He didn't share with anybody. He didn't look how to change his life. He didn't make any adjustments for the preparations out ahead. He did nothing. He thoroughly botched it. He thoroughly. No inward look. No outward change. No extension of sharing. No accountability to what, like a wowza moment of, I'm going to be grateful for what you gave me. None of it. Maybe at one time he did, but now he's being accused of losing sight of all of that. That's what's going on here. No introspection. No outward manifestation. No extent of sharing. No extent of being accountable to the master. None of it. Thoroughly squandering. That's what he's being accused of. So the, so the rich man gives him a chance to come, come clean and just tell a side of the story. What does this I hear about you? Yes. Um, Laney said, is he a type of the one who hides it in a napkin? He's the meek, yes. He's Probably the meek gross of sperm up with it in a napkin. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, that's correct. Back to okay. Luke 19, 20 to 24. So in Luke chapter 16, verse 2, he said, having called him, he come, tell me, what does this I hear about you? Like, like talk, talk to me. <laughs> Talk to me. Is, is this true? Not that he doesn't know. He does know, right? He wants him. Tell me what, tell me what the truth is. Tell, tell me your side of the story. 
And he, he tells him, he says it this way. He says, render an account. The word render here is apotos. A-P-O-D-O-S. It means dos, what you've been given, and then apo, which is from. In other words, from the obligations given to you, speak to that. Forget what all they said and didn't say and all the things they were accusing you of. L let's talk. Render, speak to me about what I gave you and, and from those obligations, what are you doing about them? What are you doing with them? Just speak to that. Forget the Don't go to the accusation list and, and, and answer one by one, line by line, all the falsehoods. If they're false, they're false. He's not even concerned about that, is he? So certain rich men didn't even ask about that. He didn't say, hey, person A said this, and B said that, and C said this. He didn't care. He said, all I care about is the truth of what's in your heart and what you know and what you know that I know. So I'm going to cut to the chase here. What's this I hear about you? Why don't you, out of what I gave you, out of the obligations I gave you, Speak to me. Talk to me. Let's talk. And then he says, right there, account of your stewardship. In other words, and the rich man already knew that the accusation was true because in the end of, end of that comment, as if to indict him, as if to say, look, it doesn't matter what he or she said. He already knew the truth. He wanted him to know that because he wanted him to go back to the point of, hey, out of what I gave you, won't you give an account of that? And he's like, oh, crap. It doesn't matter what people said about me. I, I did botch this. It doesn't matter if that, that person was mean and ugly or that was wicked. Think about it. It's like Paul acting like a fool. And he can go, well, Corinth kept on questioning my apostleship. Well, Corinth kept on saying they didn't care about me. And God goes, da, 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 da. it doesn't matter what they said. How did you live when you know what I expect of you? And he's like, oh, that sucks. And he's like, well, it doesn't matter. There's no narrative. There's no comment section. You just have to answer the question. How are you doing what you're supposed to do? And that's what he's asking. And the guy's like, oh, man, he's caught with his, he's caught with his guard down going, oh, my gosh. This is, this is bad. This is not good. Not good. Render an account of your stewardship. For you can be a steward no longer. And the word for steward there is okonomi us. That's in the plural. That means you can no longer. That means ongoing. You will be stripped of your stewardship. Are we clear on this? The household manager title is no longer yours. Not temporarily, ever. Gone. We're done. Like, yikes. And you don't get stripped of that ongoing unless you've been what? Judged. And you're not judged until what? Bema seat. So what did chapter 16, verse 2 just tell us what just happened? The Bema seat just happened. There's no rendering an account and being taken out of a station or position ongoing, unless you've been judged. That's a Bema Seat reality. Chapter 16, verse 2 is Bema Seat. Kaboom. Yes. Tracy said, is this what happens at the Bema Seat? I have that. It's answered that. There you go. Boom, right? <laughs> right? So yes. So in verse 3, he said, and the steward said within himself, I love when the phrasing is like this. This happened before with the prodigal son, remember? He said within himself, he was about to align with the Gentiles, about to align with the evil. Then he goes, what am I doing? What am I doing? His human nature wanted the, the path of least resistance, but his spiritual nature realized that's not good. Just like this man. That's why these stories are linked together a little bit. This man looks inside himself in verse 3, and the steward said within himself, what shall I do? What shall I do? Because the Lord takes, and that word takes, it means aparatai. It means to ongoingly take from, cut off. Another explanation, another wording. It's in the plural to emphasize the stewardship's no longer his. He took it away, cut it off ex extendedly. There's no end in sight where he can ever get restored to this position. It's been stripped from him. Yes? And Tracy said, laugh out loud, yes, pressed and answered before asked. <laughs> yeah. So... He says this word, aparatai, and the ongoing AI at the end, just like the previous stewardship word in verse 2, left side of your margins in the AS, which is plural. So the stewardship taken from him, plural, which means ongoing. And the ongoing ability for him to be a household manager, gone. His ability, so what he had been given, his possessions taken from him, his position stripped from him. Again, he was stripped down and sent out. Yikes. What a sight. 
What a, what a, yeah, gosh, gut wrench. Yes. And Laney said he also answered mine if I just look at the chart. Yeah, that's all right. So he said, for, he said, for my master takes the stewardship away from me. And he didn't just say stewardship, he said the stewardship. You see, because remember, the, the article thought always emphasizes the stewardship. So what is this, what is this trying to tell you? Here, catch this. The man says he took the stewardship from me, which means he will not have the chance to be a household manager again. It does not mean that his knowledge of the stewardship things won't serve him some good and benefit in the Masonic reign, depending on how he responds. See the difference? When he said the stewardship, he means the position, the responsibility of the possessions, the benefits that, that could come with that are gone. The, steward, the stewardship is taken from me. But the knowledge of what it means to be a household manager, the experience of how already having been a household manager positionally, being given the opportunity to grow within that sperma, he still retains that. Now the question becomes, how is he going to respond to it? And that's why the rest of the story unfolds. He can never get back what he has. It's like you've been a disgraced, and that's why later on he's going to say, I'm ashamed. It means he's been disgraced, dishonored. Dishonorably discharged, if you will, from service. Doesn't mean he forgot how to load his weapon and, 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 and act and discipline himself as, as a soldier when need be. It just means he didn't do the things that were becoming. And he did things unbecoming. And that's why he was discharged, he dishonorably let go. That's why he says in verse 3, for a master takes the stewardship away from me and I have not strength to dig. That means he has no vigor, he is weak. Weak meaning he has no, he has, again, there's no stewardship. He, all the knowledge that he could have stacked up has been taken, all he has is what he has. He can't go any further. Remember, as a Mikros, are you strong in, in sperma understanding? No. You don't know, all you know, you're aware, but you don't have any strength to dig. You can't build 30, 60, 100 fruit. You got no shot. If you just stay there, there's no way. So he's saying, I got no, I'm weak. I have no vigor. I have no the, the possessions I did have, I could have built on to grow in my faith and, and build up the 3600. That's been taken from me. I'm just, all I have is my experience of what I did have, the, the knowledge of what I did have, but there's no new knowledge given to me. I'm weak. I have no vigor. There's no new insights I have to God and His Word because that's been taken from me. All I have is from what I already have been given. And I have to vet through that and take the best of that and squeeze out of that some opportunities to, to, to have a good response to my master, to my, my father. And he says, not only I have no strength to dig, he says, and the word dig, again, means, it means to, interesting enough, he, he before dug in, a, dug in the dirt and hit a napkin from the parallel understanding who this person is in Luke 19. Whereas here he's saying dig, he means strength to dig as in to build a foundation to grow his faith. Much like the earlier passage in Luke 14 about ending about being a disciple and how you're supposed to take count of a tower and how you build your faith on the secrets of the mystery. How do you build up? You have to calculate. You have to write down what is it going to exact from me? What kind of discipline, sacrifice, time, effort? What, what do I have to commit? How do I have to be disciplined to put blinders on to the outside world's lies and corruptions? He has no strength to dig. He has no strength. He can't ongoingly grow in his faith at this point. He's stuck at the level he's at. He knows that. That's what he's talking about. I can't build a foundation. I can't build up. I'm stuck where I'm at. He took from me the okonomias. And he also has taken, he's cut off from me the apparatai, meaning all the responsibilities of the stewardship, all the benefits. And I am ashamed, last part of verse six, chapter 16, verse 3, I am ashamed to beg. The word is shamed, it means I am dishonored. I am disgraced. He's disgraced. It says to beg, and that word to beg means I don't even have, I don't even, he said, I don't even have the ability to be like a beggar who would beg for food. That's how bad it is. I'm not disgraced. I have no right to ask, who am I to ask a person of sporos? If you're a person who got the sperm, as a Migros, and you did that to it. We just read. And you're going to go on the earth and miss on a grant and go, help me out, please. It's like having somebody who is a multimillionaire squander their money, and you're asking someone else who's on food stamps to help you. 
Like, they, they're like, look, man, I'm disgraced and dishonored. How, should, how could I possibly ask them when they're the ones who never experienced what I had and I just squandered it? That's a monetary relevate reality that's nothing compared to the spiritual this dichotomy. He's like, look, I, I can't, I, I, <laughs> I can't even beg to these people. They don't understand what I'm coming from. They have no idea what I lost. People of Sporos cannot relate to what's in the heavenlies. They cannot relate to the inheritance that this man was in a position to attain, and it was stripped from him, never to be seen again. He is like, I, 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 how, how do I explain that? I, you can't explain that. It's like, I can't even keep a word to this. You know, it's almost like if you spend a lot of time in your craft, if you, if you are in, in your role and responsibility, whether you spend time or not, it's unique to your knowledge of your skill and your craft. You would know unique things that are only appreciated by you, especially more so when you put the time and effort into it or a lack thereof. Only you can kind of like uh, get remiss over what you've kind of passed over. You know best, given the role and responsibilities given to you. Yes? The lady said that is such a great insight. So then he says in verse 4, he even says it this way. He says, and I know, and that word is egnon, egnon means gnosis, out of gnosis, yes. And Laney said, I never thought about it this way, where he had the knowledge, but going to people who have no knowledge of sperma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's on the earth going, who's on? There's no one like him on the earth, no one. The only person that comes close to that is later on, as we saw earlier with the foolish virgin, is just that. The foolish virgin comes out, and even he calls the foolish virgin out going, are you insane? Like, are you, how do you not know? Oh my gosh, you, all, all I can give to the, the foolish virgin is the discernment and insight to what I have that you can apply that principle into what you have, which is more than me, to then get the rest of your fruit that you need, which is what he does to these people later on. This guy's a pivotal person. So in verse, in verse four, I know, out of what I know, I, I know what I'll do. That when I am deprived, and that word, when I am deprived, this is a key phrasing here. It's the word meta, I, got, I had to put it right now, meta statato. And it, were, and, it, and it means that you are, as the, as the, as from the root word of metanoia, so when you're changed, when you're turned away from. Wait a second. What do you mean when I'm turned away? You know why? Because what happened in verse 2 was the Bema Seat, his stewardship was stripped from him. Everything he had was taken away from him, his position. Now in verse 4 he's saying, well, when I am turned away, well, weren't you already turned away at the Bema Seat? No. No, he was not turned away. He got to enter into the millennial reign. We're going to see this later on by his interaction with the other people. That's where he's at. The question becomes, wait a minute then what does he mean by being turned away? He means, before I go to outer darkness and get turned away, as in Matthew 22, many are called, a few are called out, cast him out. So he knows what the future has in store for him. He will not be able to set foot in the glorious city when it sets foot on the earth. He's like, I can't go there. I already know that. I just, my stewardship's been taken from me. I've been cut off. Both are permanent. How do I possibly believe I can just waltz in there and have a, have a spot? There's no way. So I know me being, me, me being put off, me being you know, sent, sent away, turned away, it's a matter of time. The clock's ticking. I, I got it. I know I'm going to be turned away. I do not have access to the New Jerusalem in day eight, in the day of God. But I know who does. Other folks I'm interacting with. So if I help them, Maybe, just maybe, if I can help them not to go the way that I've gone, if I can show gratitude over God not judging me and putting me down to Gehenna or Hades, but just stripping me, it beats the alternative. I was stripped. I was, I was, I was exiled. I was basically given no shot ever recovery, but it sure beats going down to Hades and Gehenna, and I'm on the earth, and I got a chance to respond correctly. So at least during the day of God for a thousand years, I can come in and out when I give sacrifice and I can be, I can actually see the new Jerusalem. And that's what he's thinking about. I can at least, I won't be able to inherit it, but I can experience it. That, that's not bad, not bad, not a bad alternative, not a bad runner-up prize, especially when you consider all that he was embarrassed by, ridiculed by, stripped from where he was. 
And by the way, what kind of a mindset of a person to take to, to think that way? I mean, gosh, it's just so hard. So he goes in and he says, I, I don't know what I, when I'm deprived. I know what I'll do when I'm turned away, when I'm metathasso right here in, in verse 4. I know what I'll do. He says, uh, when they take the stewardship, that, I may, so I, that they may receive me into their own houses. Notice how he says, receive me into their own houses, and that is their oikos. And Jesus' comments in John 14, I go to a prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. My Father's house are many. Monoias, which is mansions, we translated, which is dwelling places. That is not the same thing as oikos. This is actually houses. Later on, he talks about Aeonian tabernacles, or skinas, which is actually the specific name of the housing. So you have three different alignments there of what's going on. Because in John 14, it's in the plural with an ongoing dwelling in view with the apostles and the heavenlies. Here with the oikos, he means that they have a home. They have a dwelling place. But he defines it later on as a skinos, which is a tabernacle, which means temporarily in the New Jerusalem. Yes? And Lainey said, I never thought about it this this where he had a knowledge but going to people who have no knowledge no, you, of you mentioned that, babe. Sad. You they mentioned that. that. Yep. And then she said sad. Yeah, it is sad. It's very sad. And so he says he says here in verse five, and calling each one of his master's debtors. Now this word for calling each one of his master's debtors is the word pros kalismenos. <laughs> and it has the word for pros from kaleo to call and minos the remaining. So he's calling the remaining ones because guess what? Read the left side of your margin in verse 5. And having summoned, so he's basically calling to the remaining, he's calling the remaining debtors as he is a debtor himself. He's the Mia debtor because he owed the most of the three in view. He just got deliberated against how we saw him. We're about to see the other two come into view here. And that's why he says in verse 5, And having summoned each one of the debtors of the Lord of himself, not to him, of the Lord, which means he's part of those debtors. And that's why he says to the first, to the protos, because he's the Mia. In other words, he's telling you, there's no worse debtor in the millennial kingdom than this guy. He owes the most of those who've entered the, the, the messianic reign. There is nobody who entered the messianic reign who owes more to God than him. There's no one. He's making that extremely clear. And that's why he goes, trust me, I know this. I know that there's a debt you have to pay, and I can't ever repay mine back. I got no shot. You do have a shot. So I'm here to help out. So I'm just here to tell you that my goose is cooked. Uh, put a fork in it, it's over. I can't change my reality but I can change how I can respond to this, and I can change how, in, in the future, how I may have a better uh, uh, you know, consequence. It won't be as harsh against me. I'll still be in our darkness, but at least I get to actually you know, visit the place, uh, the New Jerusalem, when it sits on the foot of the earth. I mean, I, I'd love to have that second runner-up prize. It's better, it's better than having, again, nothing, than having just be disparagingly, you know, oh, right? Yeah. He says receiving them into their own houses. Does it mean that he doesn't have a house or that their houses are better than his? It means that their houses are better than his. Wow. He yeah. does have a house, but it's not a good one. It's, it's, yeah, I, I, yeah. He's not, people aren't considered to have, well, they're not, to your question, people aren't considered to have an oikos in the outer darkness because you're not, because housing in the day eight uh, point is relevant to those who are residing in the New Jerusalem. But I thought this was day seven where he's going to. He, so he must have some kind of house in day seven. Okay, no, no. No, no. He's saying, because you give a quick, quick, good point you're asking me. What he's saying in verse 4 is, I know that I will do when I am deprived. He's not going to be deprived or sent away until the end of day 7. So if he's talking about, well, what, what, what am I going to do at the end of day 7 when I'm turned away, when I'm deprived of my stewardship? I know what I'll do so they can receive me into their own houses at that time. So he's doing things in day 7. So at the end when he's turned away in our darkness, in day 8 he received in their houses. That's what he's saying. Does that make sense? So he's not, he's not being received in their houses in day seven. He's talking about being received in their houses that they inherit for day eight. Yes? Uh, first of all, Vicki said, 
uh, could you say that this person has another level of stewardship by helping those on earth to understand things? Like you said, he was doing this for himself, not at all altruistic stewardship, but still a type of stewardship. Yeah, he's yeah, correct. He doesn't have he doesn't have the oikonomos anymore. Oikonomen. He's being he's a steward, but he's not the steward of this of the sperm. He's a steward only in the capacity of that he once was, and he had an experience and knowledge of that, and because of that, that title or that is stripped from him, but that understanding, that experience, the ramifications, the responsibilities to the level he knew is still within him. He just doesn't have the ability to act on it to benefit himself, unfortunately, because it's been taken from him. Yes? Okay. And um, Blaney said, how would he know he would not enter if he didn't grow in this word? And uh, Vicki said, could you say that this person has another level of stewardship? By helping those on earth to understand things, yeah. maybe I read this already. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So he would have another and, level of stewardship. And as far and, as how do you know he wouldn't enter? Because remember, because of what the master said to him. The master said that you, you don't forget. The wording is key. The verse two, the stewardship, the ongoing plural. It ends in the plural sense. Ongoing. The ongoing stewardship stripped from you. He knows since he's in the millennial kingdom and he's entered in. Well, since stewardship's been stripped from me, now and ongoing, <laughs> there's no way. Because he has heard and he's aware that there's going to be a new Jerusalem sitting down. And he's like, well, I'm not going to be able to enter into that. He just, he just told me my stewardship's gone forever. But he told him, by the way, I'm taking from you, kicking you out. I'm taking from you permanently your position. That's how he knows. He's like, this is a matter of time. I've entered into millennial reign. It's great. It's wonderful. It's nice. You know, maybe it's the alternative. But he knows once it comes to the end, he's like, oh, my steward's just taking from me. To Vicky's point, I'm just being a steward. I'm being placed here now only as to act as a conduit to, to, to express the stewardship I did have, the experiences I did have, the knowledge I did have, and, and be tested and vetted. What am I going to do with it? To help others. And then once that comes to an end, at the end of day seven, he knows that's it. That's it. And he realizes the, as he calls it in verse 4, the depriving. That's when he's sent away. Get out of the kingdom. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. As he says over in, in Matthew 13, God weeds out the, the iniquitous people out of his kingdom. He's, he's one of them. You go. That's why he calls them unjust ongoing. Doesn't change, by the way. It doesn't change. He's unjust. By the way, later on when it says God applauds the unjust steward, the word unjust is in the plural. It doesn't change. He doesn't, he doesn't change his status. He cannot change his status. That's how he knows. He knows. <laughs> His status can't change. All he can do is do the best he can to respond, to please the master with showing the best efforts without any benefit to himself other than a hope, a, a, a thought that, well, maybe I get to at least enter every now and then. You know, maybe they'll, they'll invite me into their house from time to time. He doesn't say he'll have a house there. He does have a house in the New Jerusalem. But maybe he'll get invited. <laughs> maybe he gets a chance to see it. That's all he's hoping for. That's all he can get. Yeah. But he does tell them to be dishonest and deceitful about what they owe the man. No. 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 I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you about. I used to think that. It's not true. I'll, 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 I'll mention that. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, babe. Okay. Pam said, "Are the masters debtors, the accusers?" In verse one. No, I don't think so. And then, uh, Laney. Let me see. Um, go ahead, and then when I find her question, uh, I'll, I'll read it. Now, I don't think I don't think Pam, to your question, I don't think the debtors are the accusers, and the reason I don't think that is because they themselves in the situation they're in wouldn't have known enough. I think it's people higher up than him, which would have been more like the 30, 60, 100 fruit people who would have been calling him out. So I think that personally, uh, maybe even a technon person, patty on people, patty on technon, and so on, but specifically the fruit yield mature ones people, it had to be somebody higher than him to call him out for not, because in other words, if you're lower than him or the same as him, how are you going to know what you're supposed to be doing? What, what he's supposed to be, how do you know what he's squandering? How, how do you know that? 
but, but if you know what he knows, or if you know, you may be the one who accused, but you definitively can be the one who accused when you know. If you know more than he knows, and you know that what he's accountable to fully, then you can make the accusation, right? So if you know less than, it's hard to make an accusation of what he's wasting, because you don't know the idea. You don't know the role and responsibilities he has, the depths of the secrets of the mysteries. You wouldn't know that. So, but, but, if, but if you, again, had that knowledge equal to, or more than likely greater than, then you could easily be the accuser. That, that's my take on that. But I guess it's a great question, I think. Yes? Uh, now, verse 1 would be prior to the Bema seek, so it could Correct. be the accuser of the brethren, Satan and Cor his host accusing him to God. That, 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 that could be, but, but um, the fact of the matter is um, it could be, but I don't think that, yeah, it could be. It could be. I, I don't, it could be. But the fact that he was being, he was being accused of squandering his possessions thoroughly, it, it, I don't think of Satan that way because the, the word the accuser didn't come up here. He didn't say that. It, it, so he didn't say the word diabolos, which is how the word accuser is translated to Satan. It said dia defate, which is more to cast disparaging negative comments on. To your point, Satan would just tear him up. and I, I don't know. It just doesn't seem. I, I see what you mean by the word accuser, the accuser, but not the same. Yes, babe. Sorry. Uh, no, I think that's it. That's it? Okay. So in, in verse 5, when he says, and calling each one of his debtors, again, he's, he's calling the remaining debtors. So he's the Mia. We're about to see the Protos and the, and the um, Deuteros, which are the ones who owe a bath of oil and cores of wheat, 100 each. And he calls each, and he says to the first, the Protos, how much do you owe my master? This is the first time that, uh, second time, excuse me. So there were certain, the certain rich man in verse 2, remember in verse 3, or excuse me, third rich man in verse 1, my apology. So the rich man in verse 1 is now called the master in verse 3. Then again, he's called the master in verse 5 by the steward. So the steward knew that the rich man was his master. When you say master, he imputed that. Not, the rich man didn't say, I'm your master. The, the steward said, my master, which means, going back to Luke 19, he knew the harsh accountability of being a servant of not just common knowledge. He knew. He knew. And by the way, that's why before, in other sermons I've given in the past, people don't like it when I'll say God is our father, but he's also our master. And people of the Sporos, all they know is the word of God, they get mad at me. They go, don't say that. God's our father. That is it. Um, yes, and he's our master too. What's wrong with that? Oh, you can't say that. That sounds sacrilegious. It sounds like you're being like dominating and, and dictatorial and you're being really ugly and mean. Um, no, no, because and, and God's going to talk about in Luke later on how he just says to the servants, and when I tell you to come in and, and, and do your food, and, I mean, give God of the food and service, do I say have a seat? No. You did what you're bound to do. Move along, little man. Move along. Like, wow. Jeez. I mean, he makes it very clear to us that, 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 yeah, we are his children, but we're also his servants. Just like he's our father, but he's also our master. Both are true. Don't tell me one's true and one's not. That's a lie. They're both true. So when you see things talking about him being your father, loving you, just remember and, and embrace that endearing relationship between child and father. But then also don't forget that he's your master and you're his servant. You have a responsibility. He loves and forgives and compassionately reaches out forever and a day. Oh my gosh, it's awesome how much he loves us. But he also says, I expect a lot from you. And he makes that pretty clear. Well, there's even a score of song. Jesus says, my Lord, my master and savior. Yeah, they put it all together like he's just some, like some captain of a ship and that's all the, the way the master thing in their mind works out. He's just, you know, steering your life away. But as far as answering to him, they're like, ah, oh, no, 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 no. It's just like, he's a loving father. I could go ahead and screw up royally. I could to go back to him. He just washes me off and puts me back in place again. I'm good to go. I'm like, yeah, but there's an accountability to keep on doing that. You just can't keep doing that. That's what Hebrews talked about. But anyway, so if you go into this versing, and he calls him master again in verse 3 and verse 5, I wanted to point that out, that the steward said that, not the, the rich man. He didn't call himself the master, which again imputes the idea of how he viewed the rich man, which how he then viewed their relationship, which how he then knew what the accountability was, wasn't just as a delegation. It was as a responsibility of heavy accountability. Verse 6, Luke 16. He said, that for the one, how much do you owe? He said, 100 baths of oil. And he said to him, take back your account 
and sit down quickly and write one for 50. So some people say, oh, he's cooking the books, man. He's cooking the books. He's cooking the books. The guy said 100. He said, give me it. Write down 50. Here's what you have to understand. In the actual culture, as the seller, which is us who are transacting business, this, in this case, the person with the baths of oil, or later on, the course of wheat, they're the seller. They have to transact it to produce what they need to give to the master. So he says, how much do you owe? The tradition is you take what you write down what you have sold. And so he goes, how much do you owe? And he goes, I, I got 100. No. What was happening is the person thought he had 100. And the unjust steward goes, no. No, let, 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 let me see. He goes, no, you've added this completely wrong. You have 50. What he's doing is not cooking the books. He's correcting this person's presumptive, ignorant, arrogant mindset. Sound familiar? Just like the Migros. He's like, I am so idiotic, my friend, who owes the baths of oil. Let me tell you something. Uh, a couple years back, before the judgment seat of Christ, I had an opportunity given to me, like it was given to you right now. And by the way, I did the same thing you're doing right now. I presume that, yeah, it's okay. He gave me this. I'll just bury it. At least I won't waste it, you know. And then, then, I, then I, I was arrogant enough to think, even though I knew he was harsh, everything would be okay. Everything would be fine. It wasn't. It wasn't fine at all. He called me Paneros. Not fun. Not fun. Then he took from me everything. And I'm telling you, Mr. Baz of Oil, you need to stop rounding off and counting things as if, as if they're not. I did the same thing. I thought I was doing okay. I wasn't doing anything great. I wasn't doing anything horrible. I was just taking that mediocrity path. And I'm telling you, no, you do not. You say you think you owe. When he says you owe, it's a, it's a phraseology, if you will, that he's, he's asking the seller, show me what you got on your ledger. Show me. And he goes, I got 100. He goes, <laughs> no, you don't. You do not have 100 baths of all, my friend. He can tell his fruit yield and say, no, you got 50. And 50 is a number five, God's grace, times 10, God's overall completion. So there's many people who enter the millennial reign who are going to be ignorant enough to think that because God was so nice to them and gracious to them to give them an entrance, they might take it lightheartedly and not as serious as they should to obtain the level of fruit yield to inherit. And so he's telling them, you, you best not do that. I went that way. I thought the same thing. How privileged am I as a microbes of sperma, I thought? To have gotten secrets and mysteries that not everybody gets. I'm in the minority. Yes. Yes. I was so happy. I was so elated. I was so wow. I was so wow. And I thought, I don't want to waste it, so, so I'll just bury it. And I'll just keep it right here nice and safe. But I knew he was harsh. And I knew what I had was pretty dynamic. But I did nothing with it. I squandered it. And I had a bad reality happen to me. And I'm telling you, that's why I stand before you now. Do not mischaracterize what you owe. I thought all I owed was just to maintain what I had. And he told me straightforward, no, I want to reap up what I, I'm going to pick up what I have not sown. I want to reap what I have not harvested. And this guy here at the Baths of Oil was saying, oh, 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 I've, I've written down that I, I owe 100. He's like, no, 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 that's not, that's not how much you, you owe. <laughs> okay, so he said, how much do you owe? He's asking him, what does your ledger say so far that you've attained? That's what he's basically asking him. How much, how much of your transactions have you kept stock of? That's, what, that's what's going on. He's showing him, he's showing him his ledger like, okay, I owe 100, because he's basically thinking he's, he's arrived. He, he, he's obtained what he, what he needs. He's like, I got 100. And then he's going, no, 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 you don't. You got 50. You got 50. You need to get 100, because the reality is you think you have 100, but you don't. Just like I thought I was OK, and I wasn't. You are way off base here, my friend, way off base. He tells him you're way off. And then, then he, by the way, then he says, he says to the other person, and by the way, look, look back at this, this phrasing when he says, take back your account. The word for account is grammata. It's the letter of debt. It's the letter, that's what it means, letter of debt. That's why he said to him, receive thee the letter of debt and sit down and write down 50. In other words, the letter of debt was what I was telling you. It's a, it's a, it's a practice. The seller would, would, would write down what he's selling. He said, how much do you owe? He goes, I, I got 100. In other words, from what he's transacted, that's what he owes the master. He's selling on behalf of who he's put him out to the field to sell. And he goes, well, I've raised 100,000 that I've got to give to the master. 
You haven't got 100,000. Be out of your mind. You got 50. And he's like, what? No, you're counting this all backwards in half foot. No, he is basically posturing and assuming that his fruit yield is more than what it really is. I guess it's That's the problem. Tenant farmer owing to investors. I, I've got, I owe 100 to the, that, that's what I achieved in the field, but I didn't really. Yeah, so, it's like, so, yeah. so he, he gave him goods to go transact business, in this case, spiritual doctrine. And he's writing down how he's been doing with the spiritual doctrine. And he puts down that he's, he's, he's earned 100 to then give back when he goes back to home base, the master. Okay, here's what, I, here's, what I, here's what I've earned. Here's my 100. So he's telling the unjust steward when he asks him how much he owe, he goes, well, I got 100 because that's, that's what I've drummed up. That's the business. That's the commissions I've earned. So that's what, that's what I owe, the 100. He goes, no, I hate to tell you this, my friend, but you only got 50 because he's looking down the ledger of all the things he's written down, that what he knows and what he's done. He's like, this does not equate, equate to 100-fold fruit. Not even close. You're halfway there, my friend. You're, even half, you're, even, you're halfway there. You're, you're, you're way off. You have credited yourself with twice as much as you should have. You're way off. So they both think they're a near of Sporas. He, but no, the, the, cor, the course of wheat guy is a different person. That's the person who's like the, the, the covenant people who became a testament, who become the wife of God, whereas these people of baths of oil are going to become heirs. But the two different people, but they're both mis misunderstanding who they are for those reasons. Yes, sorry, babe. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, Todd said a steward is asking the debtors to show him their liabilities, not their assets. Your theory is saying the steward is asking for an asset report. He's, he's, asking, Vicky, for, he's asking for what have, you what, are, what, are, what have you generated in business? Because that's what's going on here. Because remember, He's being, remember, it starts off with him being accused of squandering his master's possessions. And he knows, as the micros hid the napkin and the, and, and, and the dirt of the soil, that he did not transact business. He didn't earn any interest on it. So he knows he wants to figure out that he wants to make sure these guys understand that same principle. You better transact business. So he's asking, how much business have you transacted? Show me your, give me your ledger. And that's why he says, hey, Take this bill back. You think you have 100 and you don't. Your math is off. You're counting way too much to this doctrine, way too little to this, to this acting of, of, of fruit yield. You, you, you're not where you think you need to be. You think you got 100 fruit right now? No, no you're not. No you're not. I guess they're both saying they think they attained the highest they possibly could. They thought they were done. Yeah, they were, and he's like, no, you have some more work to do. I, I, I suggest you get to getting because there's time running out here. You better help, he's helping these guys to become heirs because he's having them adjust their accounts correctly to what they actually have transacted versus what they thought they did. They probably That's thought they were just going to stay through the millennium, these two. Yeah, and by the way, it, yeah, and by the way, this, this isn't on a familiar territory. The fullest virgin in heaven is doing the same thing. The fullest virgin in heaven is thinking, I got the lamp, I'm good, and all of a sudden, hey, and it starts to go out, where's my oil? What's your problem? You thought it'd be over like that which is a word picture of you presumed that you were done, that you have arrived, that you have nothing else to transact. That's on you. That's on you. You did not take the oil with the lamp. That's on you. Just like this person here. You're the one who counted higher levels of value in transacting with doctrine and, and application. You counted it worth more than what it really was. And you don't realize you owe the master uh, twice as much as what you actually have earned. You haven't earned 100 yet. You, almost, you, almost, you think you have 100, you, have not there, you only have 50. You owe him more. I'm telling you, you're not where you think you are. You think you've, you've reached your goal? You haven't. You're, you're halfway there. He's like, halfway? Well, yes. You've misrepresented these transactions inappropriately and incorrectly because your arrogant, pious, presumptive self is wrong. And trust me, John Joe Stewart's going, I know what you're talking about. I get it. I was the same mindset. But I can't save myself. I can certainly help save your future. Trust me, please fix your ledger and get to get to move in the right direction. Yes. Vicky said, uh, "Why would the debtor inflate the amount that he owed? What would that do for him?" Because the debtor, when he says the amount he owed, he's talking about the amount of transacted business that he's earned. Because remember that the story starts off with the steward, who was accused of not generating, of not is not generating what he should have generated out of what he was given. He was wasting it. 
So the unjust steward is asking the same thing to this guy. This guy thinks that he has generated 100 cores of wheat, and therefore that's how much he owes. So how much he owes is a misleading comment because it makes you act and think like, oh, I mean, he's, has to, he's just talking about what, what, what he's owing, what he owes. But why does he owe that? He thinks he owes that because that's what he thinks he has transacted. He's keeping track of his transactions. That's the phrasing that's key to this. When he says, receive the bill. The bill is the grammatta. It means the letter of the letter. Or it's a word that means the letter, the writing. And in this phrasing, in this story, it means the letter of debt. And in the idiom, you keep a track of what you've transacted. And why is he doing that? Because he knows he's been put at the dock and he's going, okay, I've sold this much. Okay, I, I've sold $18 worth of tea barrels. I owe it to my, my master. And he goes back and goes, no, I think you misunderstood. Um, that tea is worth more than that tea. So actually, um, you sold a lesser tea? And that was only $9. So you don't, only ex you don't actually have a tea. What? Well, yeah. There's different kinds of tea? Yes! And he's going, what? He's like, you better get back to, you thought you were done. They master, his master said, you, you, you just raised 18 bucks and you're done. He's like, uh, 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 I, don't, I don't have what I thought I had. That's what's going on here. He's describing to him how he's misjudged, misunderstood, misapplied, just missed it totally, just like he did as a Necros. Yes. Okay, first of all. Um, Sorry, guys. Uh, uh, um, I'm getting all excited. Yes. Uh, Todd said. Greg, do you follow what Preston is trying to communicate? And um, Sandy said, sorry, Todd, Greg just stepped away. Vicki said, um, so he was inflating his transactions, the things he produced. Correct. Therefore, he isn't where he thought he was in earnings. Correct. Correct. He thought he thought his earnings were X, and you give your earnings back to the master, right? And so he's thinking, I have I've earned this much. So that's how much I owe him. And he's like, you haven't earned that much. You've only earned fifty. That's what's going on here. He's mischaracterized, misjudged, miscalculated. Call it what you like, but the fact of the matter is, he's wrong, right? Well, he's straight up wrong. It's amazing how the steward is so intimately acquainted with their shortcomings and not with his own. It's like the boat. In uh, well, his eye and the beam, I mean, well, no, their eye and the beam no, but well. remember, remember, no, 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 remember, remember, he had the beam of seat. That's how he knows. Remember, Don Judge Stewart got the beam of seat judgment. This is happening. Right, this is happening in the millennial reign. This is happening. That's how he knows. You see, he knows his. He knows. He knows his own shortcomings. He just can't fix it. He already got judged at the beam of seat, and now he's in the millennial reign, helping these people who've entered to get their ledger correct. That he can't correct this. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah. Now, were these people that he's uh, helping to fix were they not at the beam of themselves? Or? No, they were at the beam, but they, they weren't. They were there, but they weren't of the same ilk as him. They one of the cores of wheat was the Jew. They weren't the, the Jews didn't go to the beam of seat. The Jews came in, as we know, through Petra, uh, the cores of wheat. The Baz of all people were at the beam, but they entered in as people that were just of the lower shelf of Mikros, um, uh, uh, Nepios, excuse me, Mikros and, and Pation. Technon, I'm sorry, I mean, it's just a patty on Technon. They just entered in. So they entered in, but they don't. Right. Sporos, of Sporos. Yeah. That's right. So all I'm saying is they got the BMC, yeah, but they don't, they don't, they've entered in. So they don't have the same level. He was a steward who had the BMC. When a steward gets judged at the BMC, I mean, come on, it's more, that's a heavier weight than if a Sporos person gets judged. He came, he came away with a lot of knowledge and insight into like, wow, and this person's are happy they entered in. They're happy they entered in because they didn't do anything, hardly at all. To, to, they didn't inherit, they didn't get disinherited. They're happy to be there. But he's, 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 he's unhappy. But these two still avoided Hades and Gehenna. Right, uh, but remember. He, I thought some of those, I thought only the Anerosporos could avoid Hades and Gehenna. No. The other no, you there. can enter in as, as a, you, yeah. you can enter in as not being, if you're an heir, you're an Anera of the earth. As a Sporos person, you can inherit the earth. You can enter the earth, or you're disinherited under the earth. Those are the three outcomes as a person in Christ. In Christ, you can be under the earth, disinherited. On the earth, you can enter or you can inherit the earth. Those are the three outcomes of being of a sporos. That's what probably the mistake is in your thoughts, that so you're, you're not factoring that middle person. Yes. Yeah, uh, Vicky said this throws a new light on the unjust steward. Yeah, he, so, and by the way, again, 
And, and to, to avoid the confusion over my interpretation, if you will, or my insight to what I'm trying to share with you, just remember the factual data that you cannot, dis, that you cannot deviate from, right? Fact number one, does, does the steward in verse chapter, chapter 16, verse 1, is he not accused of wasting his possessions, which means squandering thoroughly? Yes. Fact number two, does not the, the, the rich man call him into account and strip him of his stewardship? Yes. Does that not there, therefore dictate that because he was squandering it, therefore he did not transact business correctly? Fact. Therefore, at the end of the coupling of about we're about to get there in verse 8, there's no worldly, godly way that the God the Father is going to go, oh, you are a lying, cheating thief. Woo-hoo! I love that. Come on, man. There's no way he's going to do that. There's no possible way. Right? So the reason the Father in verse 8 is applauding him is because he's doing what he didn't do and helping others to understand do not transact business. Oh, squanderously and disparagingly and ignorantly like I did. I was accused. I was called out for it. I was stripped of my stewardship, sent away. I'm trying to tell you guys, please don't do what I did. I can't get back what I've lost, but you can. You can, you can gain something you never had. Well, isn't it possible the oil guy might have followed his example? Maybe not the weak guy because he was covenant, but could the oil guy have been under the steward and followed his example? Uh, but he was a Mikros of, of, of sperm. He didn't do anything with it, so it's hard to, it's hard to know that. I mean, I, I would think so, but I don't know. It's a good point. I don't know. Yeah, babe. Uh, <clears throat> Todd said, so Preston, you are saying the debtor was given an opportunity to earn 100 fruits but only produced 50? I'm saying that the, the, the 50 is, I don't know about the fruit yield relevance to that. I'm just saying that it's half of a hundredfold. So I'm saying that he had 50, per, so if it's 50, it's 50, right? So I'm, that's not really the key point about the number itself as the 50 to me, the key thing there about the number is that it represents five times 10 or God's grace and his ordinal view of all people in Christ who have entered the millennial reign, who are given an opportunity afforded them to achieve airship. At the end of the millennial reign, at the great white throne, when they are judged, as we know, people are then afforded the chance to inherit. This is the story of what's happening. This is that story. This is one of the many stories that's happening amongst those who have entered, who owe baths of oil, which is rep- representing sanctification, being, being set apart to anointing, to, unto service. This is what they weren't doing in their life to the fullness of their fruit yield. They were doing some of it, but not fully to the fruit yield. They were given entrance because they weren't disinherited for their lack of sanctification and reconciliation. They, they were entered in because they did sanctify and reconcile themselves. They just didn't have enough fruit yield, these baths of all people. And now they're given a chance to produce the rest of it. Got the, got the great white throne they're then viewed as being heirs or not, or out of darkness, right? So that's what's going on there. Yes, or out of the lake of fire. Yes, yeah, baby. Okay, first of all, Todd said hundreds of baths of oil. Vicky said a hundredfold because they were on earth during Correct. day seven. Correct, a hundredfold. And don't forget the story he just told, the prodigal son, the, faithful, the, the good son, the faithful father, was about a person of covenant who came into understanding who Christ is, the other person who was a higher person in the heavens. What a coincidence. This is about the similar thing. A person of unjust steward is totally separate from the other people on the earth he's about to encounter because you cannot compare a Sumedico's person to this person who's of covenant previously in the prodigal son story. Those two groups, 144,000, are way different. Just like he is way different. The unjust steward is way different than these people because of what he has he has no longer. For what they never had, they get a chance to have. That's a huge difference, big difference, which is aligning itself completely to what he just said before about the wayward son who never had what the faithful son always had, what the father said. Again, it's a contrast. God's giving a contrast of what's happening in the millennial reign between the heavenly blessings, the earthly blessings, and the dynamics in between. In this case, now he's changed the dynamic to how does those who had the heavenly blessings, who squandered them, and are now consigned to the earth, how are they going to respond? Let me tell you a story about one such a person. That's what he's doing. 
And that's what he's talking. And this guy is is not. By the way, not all on just stewards. I'm not going to say all of them act this way. I think he's one of many, and I think that he's unique in acting this way. I don't think this is a natural reaction. I don't think it is natural at all. I think this unjust steward is just that. He is applauded because there's many like him. There's many Mikros that do what he did. I don't think all Mikros are doing this or helping other people. I don't think that at all. I think that he's one of a few that's doing this. That, that's what I think. I think he's a unique group of few of that category of people who are Mikros who had sperma, who hit it in the earth. He's a few. There's many of those people. But it, uh, there's a few of them that act this way, that are unjust always, but then they responded the right way. That's why God's recognizing the uniqueness of this and, and, the, and the oddity of it. It's not normal. It's not common. So when he says to the other person, by the way, and the baths of well, the baths is, is the maximum uh, fruit yield. And by the way, if you compare on your spiritual growth cycle chart, you compare uh, an anir sperma is one mina, whereas a person who's a technon who's born again in sperma is 10 mina which is interesting because it's 10 times greater, which the baths of well is about seven gallons, they say. And they say the cores of weeds about 75 gallons. So it's more than 10 times greater, which is, I don't think, coincidence. The difference between this person of baths of oil is they are a sporos person. The person of cores of wheat is a sperma person. It's obvious, because the wheat gets put into fine wheat. It has more value, right? It's used in sacrifice for the wheat grain, the wheat offering. Oil is not used in sacrifice, it's used for setting apart, sanctifying, and, and sanctification, right? And anointing as king, those kind of things. So. I thought you said oil was sporous, but it's sperm. No, no, oil, oil is sporous. Okay. Uh, so the wheat is the sperm. The oil is sporous, and the wheat is the sperm. The wheat. Well, how about you originally said the wheat was the, the covenant? Okay. I guess I can. No, 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 you're correct. So let me go back. So the cores of wheat represents the Jews who were of covenant, who came into the, to the millennial reign and have now an understanding of who Christ is. They're in testament, but they're not in Christ the same as we are. And so they are growing as wheat. They're the lesser wheat who grows at the end of the millennial reign and then is given the wife of God, the Father. So yes, they were of covenant. That's what the prodigal son story was about, remember? And they transitioned to be in testament. And now he's speaking of them as these people of these cores of wheat, that they're not, it doesn't just because they got this reality of happening in Petra, they're just like those who entered in of Christ. They don't, they don't have a taste of what they never had. They, don't, they never had heavenly sperma being given to them. They don't even know. So just like this guy here, this person who enters in of the baths of wealth, has never had the fullness of the fruit yield produced by them, or fullness of the doctrine or understanding of the word of God given to them. And that's why the unjust stewards helping both of them to understand spe specifically what they're lacking in. You're lacking understanding of God's word and what it means to have under full fruit, you bow the bowl person, you course a wheat person, you're lacking understanding of what it means to have a heavenly blessing, and the fruit yield that comes with that. And I'm telling you, you both are off. You both are transacting business to a level that is lesser than what you think. You're, you're, you're putting way too much weight into what you think you have versus what you have. And you're thinking who you are versus how God sees you that you are. And this is why later on, he's going to, again, if you, if I, I, I'm not going to finish this, but I can tell you, it's okay though. I can tell you at the end of this coupling of this storyline here, that's why Jesus said at the end of the storyline about God and mammon. Mammon is not money. It's the treasure that you hold as what's, what's your value that you trust in. So if that's money or if that's other things, that could be possessions too. So your mammon is, the, is an idiom that means the treasure that you put your trust and you put your value in is what defines you. That's what mammon is. And later on he says, oh, the Pharisees, you have a love of silver. He said, oh, in the eyes of man, you're doing just great because you have the spiritual on the outside and you got the fine blessing on the inside and all that garbage, right? He's like, it doesn't, your view to your fellow man, to God, is a stench. It's an abominable stench. Why would God make that analogy, but, but that, that, that reference about the eyes of man, the eyes of God, unless he's, again, parlaying continuously on the storyline that these people, the debtors, were thinking from the eyes of man, from their logic, I got this. And the unjust steward's going, no, you don't. No, you don't. Trust me. Because I've been made clear what the, what the view of God is. Because I made that mistake. 
I've been where you haven't been, and I've come back from that place stripped clean of all my opportunity to get there again. Do you actually want me to help you? Because I can. Because I'm telling you, you're off. And you're off by a lot. And it starts with your inward man. Yeah, I would change correct. I would change. By the way, remember, they're both sinful people. They're sinners. People who enter into the, the, the millennial reign are subjected to having sin around them. Right? Those who have covenant, who came in testament, they are still sinners reproducing. So they both have either subjected to sin or have sin inside them. So they have some issues here about why they would be this way. The unjust steward is trying to help them. Yes, okay, sorry. Okay, uh, I may have read this one already. I guess uh, Todd uh, made two statements. I guess this is hard to understand because the debtors have received something that is physical, not a mental or teaching of knowledge, because the steward, by his master, uh, wasting his possessions. That is a physical accounting that takes place. So, yeah, so just, just remember that the key phrasing of the conversation between the unjust steward and the debtor is the word grammata. The word grammata, when he says in verse 6, when he says, and he said to him, take back your account, the word, the, the wording, the phrasing there, the account is the, the grammata. That means the letter of your debt, of your bill, of your ledger. It's the le and by, look it up, look it up in the idiom and you'll find out. It's an old phrasing that they would again track their transactions. So when he's asking how much you owe, it doesn't mean, what were you sent out? With a debt on your on your you, boom twenty thousand dollars you were sent out to go and get no he was saying here you, you, you're given this responsibility to go out and produce fruit you know the sporos and he goes oh, okay so he starts transacting now he may know that's a hundredfold fruit for example he starts transacting what he's been learning what he's been doing and he's writing down in his ledger and he goes how much do you owe and he's basically asked he's asking for it how do you know that because he's giving it back to him. He's giving it back to him. The unjust steward said, receive the bill, which means he was given the bill. When he asked how much he owes, he goes, here is what I transacted. The unjust steward goes, uh, no, you're way off. This needs to be 50. You need to fix that to 50. He's like, what? Yeah, you're off, brother. You're off by a lot. Then the next guy, on course week, same thing. Let me see your ledger. How much you owe? Here, how much you owe? He gives him his letter of bill. And he's like, um, see, we transacted. No, no, you got 80. You're off. What? You're off. So he goes, here, you better get that back. Here, receive back your letter of your bill and make the correction and get to work. Well, why would he say receive your bill? Unless he had been given it, right? Right? He's asking the question. They gave him the bill. He looks at it and says, you're wrong. Take it back and fix it. So that's what he's telling him. You're wrong. So here in verse 16, when he goes on, chapter 16, verse 8, and he said, the master applauded. That means he praised him. Now watch this now. The key phrasing here, which I think is just crazy, crazy. In verse 8, he says, and he praised him, the Lord of the steward, the unjust. He's calling him the steward, the unjust one. And the word unjust is in the plural. He could have used the word unjust in the regular singular tense, but no. No, no, no. The Lord wanted us to know. The Master wanted us to know. He is unjust then when he was judged at Bema Seat. He is unjust now, even though he's doing things rightly. He cannot change his station. He cannot change his position. He's stuck. But that's why he's saying, my goodness, congratulations. That's almost like that, oh, that, that I love that movie, Cool Runnings, with John Candy's character playing the real life example of a person who was barred from the Olympics for cheating. Real true story. And then the Jamaican guy, his name is Doris, he says, Coach, why'd you cheat? And he said, I learned that if you're never enough without the medal, you're never enough with it. It's a great line in the movie. But he taught him and he encouraged him. The, the, the Jamaican team encouraged him to realize, just do your best, win or lose, you can live with yourself. He wanted the medal so much, he cheated to get it. And he was barred from the Olympics. And they were not, not even wanting him to coach there because he was barred as an athlete. But the, the reality is that it kind of reminds me of that. But they, he was learning from the Jamaican team who was Jamaican, doing a bobsled for crying out loud, was learning from him about how they could actually obtain a level of, of, of quality to get on the medal stand. They could have got on there. They were on a good run until everything fell apart. But the reality is that 
that's kind of this story reminds me of that, where you have a person who's been where no one's been. That he's, been the, he's been in the Olympics, he's had the medal, but it was taken from him because he cheated. These folks never experienced Olympics, never, let, never not even in that climate of being a warm island to a cold weather race of snow sledding, bobsledding. So he's trying to take them to a place they've never been. It's kind of similar to that. It's just interesting, the dynamic. So he says, in the master, he applauded this unjust theory. It was always unjust. Because why? Because he acted prudently. And this word prudently, it has the idea of he looked inwardly. He had insight and discernment. That's, again, another key. Why did he applaud him? For cooking the books? No. For pointing out that they're, that they're dumb? No. For pointing out that they were cheating? No. He pointed out insight and discernment, which means what? Which means he knew how they were transacting business and calculating was wrong. Which, by the way, doesn't that fall in line with Luke 14 when he said he who builds the tower needs to sit down and calculate? So the unjust steward already knew he didn't do that. And so he learned a lesson of what to do differently, how to help others, where he can't help himself change his end reality. He can certainly help them. So he used his prudence, his insight and discernment to help them. And that's why it says, for the sons of the age this are more prudent as to that, as to that generation, which is those like them who enter into day, day, day seven, the sound of grain, than, than the sons of light. The sons of light are these 60 fruit mature one people, but the sons of the age this, in Luke 20, 34, he tells you who they are. They're those who enter, who marry and give in in marriage. I didn't write the book. But in Luke chapter 20, in verse 34, Jesus said, and Jesus said to them, the children left side of your margin. And he said to them, the weos, those sons of the age this, marry and are given in marriage. But those deemed worthy, see the resurrection has to be not a, not a, not a right, but a privilege. Be deemed worthy to obtain the resurrection. Everybody talks about Christianity, how the resurrection is a guarantee. Ah, wrong. And a gyro is guaranteed. You're going to be raised. But an anastasis? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That means to stand again. That is totally different. You stand before your master, before your father, then you have, you have, you have accomplished something. You don't stand unless you have accomplished something. You've been, you've been approved by him in some way of a fruit yield person. So here in Luke 20, verse 34, he said the sons of the age this are married and given in marriage, which tells you right then and there they are not heirs. They cannot be, because heirs do not have fl a flesh and blood and bone, nor do they get involved in procreation. But those who get involved in procreation are those that entered it with bodies of flesh and bone who then cave into sin and then have blood, just like in the Garden of Eden, and you have sin from the outside that can come unto, come unto you, just like you have those from the of covenant people who came in testament in Christ, the Jewish people, who then procreate others who are flesh, blood, and bone. Those people can marry and give in marriage. That's why in Luke 16 and verse 8, when he said the sons of this age are more prudent, he means that they had more insight than the, the right now mature person now. I don't have someone in my ear telling me that they've already been where I'm trying to go and have been removed and to tell me how to get there the right way. I wish I had that. Are you kidding me right now? Remember, remember the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah did not have anybody to be his mentor. Elisha had a cheat sheet that's called Elijah. He saw a front row seat what not to do. He saw right there what to do right, what not to do, and he learned, and he learned great, right? That's, that's what's going on here. That's what he means by the prudence of the sons of the age, the sons of the age this. The people in Masonic reign that are going to enter in, are going to have way more insight and discernment because they're smarter than you and me? No! Because they have an unjust steward type person who's been where they haven't been, who's already gone where they haven't gone and squandered it, and he's telling them what not to do and how to obtain it. you imagine having a coach in your corner who's already been to the heavenlies and inherited the Ariston, I mean, excuse me, entered the Ariston, inherited Dighton, and they've come back and they're going to tell you how to get there? Oh, but you, dude! Welcome to my house. You're welcome to stay all day long. Are you kidding me right now? I would love that cheat sheet. That's a nice little cliff notes, right? That's what he's talking about in verse 8. Their prudence is off the chart because, no kidding, the unjust steward is imparting to them valuable, insightful, discerning information that nobody in this dispensation has. I don't have that. 
I haven't been there and come back. Paul talked about seeing it, but he didn't inherit. John, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, they didn't inherit. They may have seen. They didn't inherit. This guy was right there, was disinherited from the heavens, judged to be received, <laughs> sent him to the millennial reign, and now he's sharing all the lessons he's learned. That is a valuable resource, man. That dude is invaluable. If I was on the earth, I'd be, he'd be my best friend. That dude, the good one that is, the good unjust steward, I want that guy to be my best friend. Because please tell me what, what not to do, what to do, how to, how to be better, how not to go the way you went, to have the same end and negative reality. Please, if you're willing to share, absolutely. I'm at, I'm at your feet listening to every day what you're saying. I mean, I want to learn from that. Why wouldn't you? Sorry. I think the thing of cheating for gain. There's a verse in the Bible that says that those that do evil in order to attain something good, their damnation is just. Oh, yeah, see? It. <laughs> evil do something good, damnation is just. That's a damn. So here you go back to what he says, and he says in verse 8, when he said, um, he, he, he says, it was like in the left side of your margin, that the unjust steward, he, he, because he was, he, he was plotted because he was prudent for what he had done. And the word, what he, what he had done is, he has poison, but it has an E in front of it, or the E. So out of what he has done. It's not just what he did. It's out of what he did. In other words, he did what he did and how he did it and why he did it. Look at the left side of your margin again for the verse 8 when it says, and the master, the master, it says, and, 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 and praise the Lord, the steward of the unjust, the ongoing unjust, because prudently he had done, which is an et, et poison. I mean, it means out of his work. Out of his work to share his discernment, to share his insight, to, to he wanted to genuinely help these people who owe baths of oil and cores of wheat. He wanted to sincerely, genuinely, heartfeltly, within his spirit, do it because he wanted them to be benefited by it. Did he want something in the back end too? Sure he did. But that's not why he helped them. And you see he helped them because God's telling him because of his prudence he shared. That's why God's applauding him. He didn't say he had an alternative agenda or ulterior motive. Or, no. No. And then he goes on and says, for the sons of the age, this, again, uh, are more prudent because, again, those who enter the millennial reign have much more insight and discernment given the fact they have an unjust steward type person who's been where they haven't been, who's gone where they haven't gone, who's done the mistakes and can share with them past mistakes. And you, they say learning from mistakes is the best thing, but someone else's mistakes are always better to learn from than your own. <laughs> and that's what's going on here in verse 8. Then in verse 9, when he says, and I say to you, make for yourselves, look at verse 9, make for yourselves friends out of the mammon of the unjust. He's talking about the millennial reign. The millennial reign. Make for yourself, as I just said before, if I knew a person who has been where I haven't been in, the, in, in, in understanding what, what's at stake in the heavens and can share with me insights of what to do and what not to do, you, you're doggone straight, I want to be my friend. How can, why would it not be your friend? Of course, that's what he's saying in verse 9. Make that person your friend. The unjust person, the ongoing unjust person like that in millennial reign, when you see them wanting to do right, make that person your best friend. Because that person will help you more than you ever realize. More than anybody else. That means more than those of Jacob's side. Those of us who are Jacob's side are coming back and forth, we're not going to help anywhere near as much as that person. Because that person can relate to those people a lot more than we ever could. A lot more than we ever could. It's unbelievable. So he says... And he says, make for this, this friends of the, of the mammon of the unjust. The mammon of the unjust. The mammon is the treasure. Remember, the treasure of where their trust is. It doesn't mean money. It means the treasure of where you put your trust. So he's telling them to make friends. And then when it, so when it fails, when it fails, oh, there it is. And that means, that, that's the word for ek, ek lipo. That means out of it causing to be left out and ceasing and failing, which is out of the end of the day seven, because eventually this unjust steward is going to come to an end and his influence of only this 1,000 year period where he has something good to say about him, it's over after that. <laughs> he starts off not so good, has some nice things potentially he could say about him, how he helps others, but then his just dessert is he's never going to be an heir, he's going to be out of darkness. That's why he says in verse 9, that when it fails, meaning him, this, that the, the friendship fails, you, that he'll, he'll receive you into only in mansions. So he's talking about, again, that word for mansions is skinos, which means tabernacles, which is the dwelling place for those he just helped out in the heavenly Jerusalem. And that's why he also says, 
again, going back to how much you owe, and he asks the question, he goes, give me your ledger here, receive it back, change it to it, right? Verse 10, think about the whole context here. In verse 10, he says, he who is faithful in a little is also faithful in much. And he who is unjust in a little is unjust in much. And so there he goes on and, and talks about something different. He says, if therefore you have not been faithful in left side of your margin, it says, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, that word's not in the ongoing text. So he means right now, right? So if you haven't, if you haven't been faithful in these things, in other words, what he's talking about now is, it's interesting, because he's talking about where you have your treasure and where your trust is in. So if you can't have faithfulness to the stewardship of what God's given you and what you understand, it's not just monetary things. It's what you understand right now. Because he was not, <laughs> he was not uh, faithful to what he knew back when he was in Mikros. Straight up, he was not. God told him he was a Panero. He was an influencer of evil. It's not good. So here in verse 11, when he says, if therefore you have not been faithful, if you have not been faithful, left-sided margin, if therefore in the unrighteous mammon, faithful not you have been, the true will not be entrusted to you. Or who will give that to you as a result? In other words, in other words, again, if if in the time when you were in a sinful state, but yet given responsibilities, because remember, this the treasure that we have now is fleeting. There is nothing here. The treasure's in heaven. The scripture talks about that. Jesus mentioned that. Don't have your treasure stored up on earth for moth and thieves can steal and corrupt. No, he said it's in heaven. So therefore, he says, but we do have, he says here, the word mammon, which means, again, the, the treasure where we put our trust in. So if you, if you can't put your trust properly in what I gave you now, because what's happening is the, this Mikros person was putting, as an unjust steward, his trust in that he was given the secrets and mysteries, that he was special, that he was unique, that he was distinct, that he or she was so different than most Christendom that 80, 90% of people have no idea what he's been given. And God goes, really? You, you, you do realize that the treasure you were given on earth compared to what is out ahead is unjust because the reality is that it's stained with your sinful mind of how you perceive things. It's stained with the sinful interactions of how you go through your process of producing fruit yield. There's no trajectory that goes like this. We all do this number. We all do this. None of us go like this. You know, no, nobody does that. That doesn't stop. No one does that. So when he says, the again, the unrighteous mammon, he means, again, the treasures where we trust in, in this life, with the unrighteous sinfulness that we have, if we're not faithful now, if we're not faithful now to how we handle God's blessings, God's treasures he gives to us, and treasure, put our treasure in heaven, not on earth, why would then, when the sin's taken away from us, why would the true, un, 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 unstained, unsoiled, un, un, unperverted, righteousness be given to us then? Why, why would he do that? Why would he give you an opportunity to, to again, have this unjust steward, for example? He didn't handle it correctly what he was given here when he was in an unjust state. Why would he be given things in a righteous state that makes no sense in a, in a pure state, in a true state? So he, he talks about, in verse 12, that's why he says, all onwardly, he says, and if you have not been faithful, and if you have not been faithful on that which is another's, what will I give you that which is your own? He contrasts it again by basically saying, so if I loaned you something, you treated it like dirt, how's it going to change because now I gave it to you and it's now it's yours, you own it. Oh, really? So if you loaned me your car and I treat it with disdain and don't wash it and give it back to you all dirty and filthy, filled with fast food remnants, that's okay. But if you said, no, it's your car to have, what's going to make you think that I'm going to treat it any differently? Because now it's my car. Oh, trust me, it's my car. I'll be different about it. Well, what is that? Either, either, either I'm a hypocrite or I don't understand the value of being conscientious and grateful for what I have been given. If you loaned me your car and I don't have one, why would I not treat it nicely and carefully, right? But he's talking about God gave us these gifts of the silver mina that we didn't deserve and how we treat it is an indication of what we will have given to us in the next life. Do we, do we, do we treasure that that we trust in or do we treasure our treasure in heaven that it leads us to in Christ himself. Because he's talking about how do we treat what's been leased to us that's going to be later on judged to us to see if we get a chance to possess it ongoingly, which is the whole process of why we take the oil along with the lamp 
So we can actually be judged correctly to say, where's your treasure? Is it in what you know? Or is it in what you know leads you to your treasure of who you serve? Because that's the whole point here. And this man knew he was a harsh man, but didn't do the right things. It's not good. Yeah? So we can view the oil and we ask mammon? You could, you can view it as, you can view it as mammon, sure. You could. And of course, it's you know, a treasure. faithful and least faithful and much. I mean, you have to learn that way. I mean, yeah. with math, you don't start with calculus. You start with arithmetic. Yeah. You've yeah. got to be faithful in the arithmetic skills before you proceed to the yeah. next level. And, ju and, you're saying, and just remember, if oil and weed and any doctrine can be viewed as treasure, which it is, the question is not treasure being bad. It's, it's where you what, what treasure is your trust in? Is it in the knowledge of God or is it in God himself? You see, that's the difference. And that's what he's pointing out here about you can't serve both God and man. You can't say God's who I trust in, and you say, no, my knowledge about God's what I trust in. You can't have both ways. Which one is it? Which one is it? Is it your knowledge of God you trust in, or is it God you trust in? It doesn't work both ways. You said it's either A or B. That's it. That's what he's pointing out when he talks about man. He means the treasure of a man's trust, of a person's trust. So when he talks about, in, in verse 13, no domestic which is a household servant. Now he's using the word, oh again, household servant again, almost like the same word for, for steward. No steward can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one, it means lesser love, lesser love the one, or he will attend or hold, he will hold fast, firmly grip the other one. For a man cannot serve. See, so he's talking about a, a steward person. So remember, a person of sporos, who's the word of God, can in fact dupe themselves and believe or I can, I can actually put my treasure and trust in the knowledge of God and also believe that I'm actually trusting in God too. That's my treasure. And they actually think that's, they can pull that off in their minds and be convinced. And God said, when you were a steward, that's not possible. You know better. You know better. And if you don't know that, then you're, no offense, then you're a foolish moros, as God calls the Matthew 25 person. I don't know how you could not, you're supposed to know that. There's no way you're not supposed to know that you, your treasure and what you trust in, is it, God, is it, is it the knowledge of God or is it God himself? It's, it's, not, it's not hard to figure out. He's just telling you, I mean, Don Joe Stewart went the wrong way. That, that's for sure. So the question becomes, what say you? Which way you're going to go, right? So he, he, that's why he ends this, that's how he ends this, this coupling of like out there verses that don't seem to connect, but they do. Then in verse 14, he said, and the Pharisees being... I love this being. That means that means that their, their being is that they possess lots of silver, being money lovers. <laughs> it says that also hearing these things, they ridiculed him. It means they went like this. So they heard him say, you can't put your trust, you can't put your treasure in what you trust in and the knowledge of God and also have it to say my treasure or what I trust in is in God himself. It's one of the two, my friend. And he's using the monetary issue of silver that they were loving to prove a point because when they heard him say this, because they were doing both, were they not? Think about it. Think about it. They were doing both. They were trusting the knowledge of the Sanhedrin, right, more than they were God. That's why Caiaphas ripped his coat and said, Sacrilege! You can't say you're the I am. Sure he can. It's a filling prophecy. If you pay attention, not to your knowledge, but to God, you'd have seen what was happening. Don't lie to yourself, Caiaphas. You know doggone well what was going on. So then the Pharisees were lovers of silver, heard Jesus say this, and their reaction physically was they turned their noses up. That's what it means. They went like they did this and oh. They turned away like, oh please, oh please, spare me your lower shelf talk. Oh, really? Like they're all pious, you know? Like, oh, I've got money out of my ears. Or oh, I got knowledge beyond the common man. We've taught them the Hebrew scriptures. Without us, they know nothing. Really? Really? That's how you're going to act? What a pompous jerk. Then in verse 15, here, here he goes. Here's the right hook from Jesus. Like, pow! Down goes Frazier. Here's in verse 15. And he said to them, You are those who just, you are those, oi. Those acting like that, not all Pharisees, those Pharisees doing that, and others like them, those like you, who are lovers of silver, those who are taking their treasure and trusting in their knowledge of God, which is symbolized by monetary blessings, versus God himself, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. 
That is the word ginosko, which means God sees it for what it is. He intently stares and knows. For that which is highly prized, which is exalted among men, here it is, is that word, is a detestable stench, an abomination to God. So you can say, well, I, and by the way, I don't know about y'all. Can't speak for y'all. That's my southern slime there, y'all. But I can tell you, I have been, and I'm not joking about this, and I've been in Christian circles of Christendom uh, ministry people. Well, I'm about to tell you what happened. And I've also been amongst business uh, meetings of people. And the similitude of conversations that have happened went something like this. They'd say, well, this guy or that gal or that person, and they start listing off not things per se, sometimes they did, but they would talk glowingly about such a so person. And they'd say, they got it all together. That's, 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 the, that's the 1A, or that's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the super. You're like, what? And they use these different words they would use, or, or that's, that, that's, a, that's the gold medal, that's, that's the champion, that's the, all the different. But they, they, what they were doing was they were labeling people by how they saw them and achieving what they determined was the most important areas of their life. So if they determine a certain level of knowledge of God, boom, you check that box. A certain level of financial blessing, boom, you check that box. A certain level of family peace, boom, you check that box. But it was all relative to them. So meanwhile, they could be treating their wives and kids like garbage. They could be stepping out on their wives and beating their kids. They didn't know that. But as long as they perceive them as being a good, good family man, they check that box. As long as they perceive them as having knowledge about God beyond the normalcy, they check that box. And so they began to have things said about them. Like they would say, that's a great godly woman. That's a great godly man. Based on their perspective and their perceptions that were watered down, polluted, perverted, wrong, incorrect, inaccurate, based on arrogant presumptions of what was acceptable to them as what was what was the greatest thing ever in their mind they, they wouldn't even be on the medal stand but they wouldn't even qualify for the olympic games but in their mind they're the champion because they have redefined what what awesome looks like and in their mind that's what awesome is and that's what he's talking about here in verse 15. there's an old adage in politics you don't know but you don't know because you're in that bubble of your own ignorance and there's an, old, there's an old adage, a guy named Ian Thomas. Um, Major Ian Thomas, he once preached about Lazarus coming out from the dead and Jesus raising him up. And he goes, the one thing about 